58 days since being acquitted of all charges, including second-degree murder, for shooting and killing 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman found himself today briefly back in police custody in Florida. According to Lake Mary Police reports, Zimmerman's wife, Shelly, who just a few days ago filed for divorce, called the police to report that Zimmerman had punched her father, was putting his hand on his gun. We pick up the 911 call just after George Zimmerman left the house, but remained on the property. He continually has his hand on his gun and he keeps saying, step closer. He, he's just threatening all of us with step closer his what? firearm. And he's going to shoot us. He punched my dad in the nose. My dad has a mark on his face. I saw his glasses were on the floor. He, he accosted my father and then took my iPad out of my hand and smashed it and cut it with a pocket knife. I, I don't know what he's capable of. I'm really, really scared. At this point, the police arrived, and Shelly Zimmerman can be heard telling her father to take cover. Dad, Dad, get behind a car or something. I don't know if he's going to start shooting at us or not. Are you guys outside right now? Yes, we are. And the, the, the police have their weapon trucks. Dad, get inside the house. George might start shooting at us. I don't know. We're going inside the house. Okay, go back inside. Are you guys both inside now? Yes. Okay, stay in there, okay? Let the police take care of it. Okay, he's got his hands in the air. He's not touching his weapon. A few hours after the call, George Zimmerman was taken into what police are calling investigative custody, which means he couldn't leave the scene until police were done trying to figure out just what had happened. Shelly Zimmerman eventually decided not to press charges against her estranged husband, who claims that Shelly was the aggressor. George Zimmerman is a free man tonight. His attorney, Mark O'Mara, says he got his gun back. Since being acquitted, George Zimmerman has twice getting pulled over for speeding. One of those times, he was armed. In another incident, he visited the manufacturer that made the gun he used to shoot Trayvon Martin. It is hard to hear this story today and not have some kind of reaction. Shelly, you're doing really good, okay? This is a tough situation for anyone, all right? Let's stay on the line with you, all right? So our units can speak with you, all right? Okay. All right, are you okay? You said he did take something out of your hand. Do you need medical as well? Um, I don't think so. Maybe just shock. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get FD to respond, okay? Okay. Dad, get inside right now. Make sure he stays inside until someone, Stay inside. Until someone comes and lets you guys know it's okay for you to step out, stay inside. Okay. Joining me now is MSNBC contributor Joy Reid, also managing editor of thegrio.com. This news broke today, and just everything in my social media universe just went nuts. Mine too. Um, why, why the intensity of the reaction to this? Well, you know, it's interesting because we were having this conversation upstairs at the Grio and we were talking about sort of remember after the OJ verdict, there was this sense in a lot of America, particularly among white America, that you know what? Karma's going to get this guy. Right. Sooner That's or later, right. this person who we just know did it is going to do himself in and something's going to happen. It's going to blow his whole life up. And I think that there is this sense that George Zimmerman, since the trial, has not behaved like a man chastened by the act of killing someone, that he's someone who is speeding through Texas and speeding through Florida and just sort of living his best life now. Taking well, let's also gun. say the gun, I mean, the speeding, whether he's speeding right. or not, the, the, the visit to the gun manufacturer, to me personally, right. as I watch, as I try to understand who this person is and how they feel about what happened and whether they're appropriately sorry for what happened, that was the moment where I was like, whoa, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. There's something sort of insensitive about it. And I think that we don't know George Zimmerman, obviously. We don't know his interior life. We don't know what he's doing in between the speeding incidents, in between the going to get the gun. But there is a sense that in his public presentation, there is a sort of a bravado to it that I think has really pricked at a lot of people, particularly in the African-American community. And so when this happened, there was a sort of holding of collective breath. Okay, what's going to happen? Is this going to result in an arrest? What is going to be the adjudication of this situation? And I think as it played out, the initial reaction to it was, this is the George Zimmerman we didn't get to see during the trial. The person who had the past violations of the law. The person who had a domestic in his past. In March of 2012. Correct. And the person whose attorney really played out every 
negative thing they could find that they believed about Trayvon Martin, but who presented Zimmerman as, as a total innocent. Um, and then now you're seeing this other side to him. So I think there was a certain amount of shot from Freud out there in the social media world. I, I should add this in terms of the domestic dispute. It wasn't in 2012. It was earlier. In 2005. There, right, 2005. There, there's also now a report coming out of uh, our, our local affiliate that it's possible that some police are saying the gun wasn't there in this incident that happened uh, today. What I think is interesting is that his wife appeared to think the gun was there, whether Correct. it was or not. And it, what it what it hit home again to me, listening to the terror in that nine, uh, 911 call, it's just the way in which the presence of a gun is transformational on all interactions between humans in the midst of conflict. That Absolutely. is the bedrock fact of what happened on that horrible night in which we lost Trayvon Martin, is the presence of the gun absolutely alters the calculus of everything that happens between two human beings involved in any kind of conflict. Yeah, it increases the level of terror, I mean, on the part, in this case, of Sherry Zimmerman, just believing, you know, whether it turns out there was a gun there or not, but her believing, she was saying she was afraid they were going to be shot, she and her father. That just the presence of that and the terror of that, uh, yeah, absolutely. And in domestic situations, we know taking the Zimmerman case out of it entirely, we know in domestic violence situations, the presence of a gun can be absolutely deadly. And that it is much more common, in fact, for that interaction to end in someone being harmed than this, the this, this situation with Trayvon Martin. And that gets us back to the record when we're talking about the Zimmerman that people feel like they saw on trial or not. And again, I don't know the man at all. Don't uh, know. And, and, and this is all through the prism of an incredibly Correct. intensely covered public trial, which can sometimes be distorting. We should be very clear. Sure. Right? That said, um, what, what struck me is that having reported on domestic violence, been around people that work in domestic violence, is violence to an intimate partner mm -hmm. is something that we somehow put in another category, right? right? There's the thing that happens in the home and mm -hmm. then there's violence to a stranger. And one of the things I think we've learned over the years mm -hmm. as domestic violence policy has gotten far more enlightened right. is that there's a connection between those two. No, absolutely. And, and by the way, in Florida, as in most states, had he been arrested, he would have lost uh, title to that gun. And that there is in the law a direct connection that if you are arrested on a domestic violence incident, one of the first things that happens is that your gun is taken away because the law does recognize the connection and the causal connection between really deadly violence in the home, domestic violence, and the presence of a firearm. So had he actually been arrested, you know, the police there, in a sense, preserved his right to keep his gun because had he been arrested, he would have lost it. And yet, the, and it's the, and it's the presence of the gun that, of course, lurks over this. It lurks over George Zimmerman's life for now. And that was the other thing I thought today when I saw this was like, what this, the, you have become this symbolic figure mm -hmm. um, of injustice, right? And that there is no, there's a certain percentage of the population, I think understandably, and I am incredibly sympathetic to, mm -hmm. that is just going to see you as embodying this horrible thing that happened. Yeah. And there, that, that pain is not going away anytime soon. It is not going away. I was struck at the 50th anniversary celebration for the March on Washington. How many people, including How members, yeah, members of Martin Luther King Jr.'s family, his sister, mentioned Trayvon Martin unasked, just read him into the narrative. He's become sort of an Emmett Till figure for a lot of people people because he is the embodiment of the sense of profiling, the sense of being out of place in one's own country, and the terror of guns, and the sense that you are not safe as long as someone with a gun thinks you're threatening. And that thing that lurks there, even if it's offstage, MSNBC contributor Joy Reid, thank you so much. Thank Great you.